Um, so uh, we just heard introductions. Uh, I also wanted to note that uh, Jen here is president and CEO of change.org, so in case you guys missed that. Um, I, and I wanted to uh, kind of just set the stage for who we're talking to here. When we talk about women in tech, uh, we often think that uh, these are like, you have to study computer science to have a career in tech. And I just want to go down the row here and ask you guys, like, what did you study in school? Like, what's your background? How did you get here? Yeah, my background, I actually studied psychology in school, and then I did also get an MBA. And I started in a very non-traditional background. I started a nonprofit first, right out of college, to help middle school kids be the first in their families to go to college. And I was also a high school teacher, which is a little bit atypical for ending up in tech. And then I spent 10 years at Yahoo, started a company, spent a couple years at Google, and now at change.org. Uh, so yes, quite a winding road uh, to my path in technology. Thank you, Anne. So me, I studied engineering, so closer to computer science, I guess. I also have an MBA. Um, and I've been in engineering for many years before I started to do more psychology with the current job I have, which is culture at SAP. I I started uh, my career in television development, so uh, coming out of school, worked at MTV uh, in series development and then at FX Networks. So I was a product of Hollywood and ran uh, Screaming from Hollywood to Silicon Valley in 2005 and started Eventbrite with my now husband, Kevin. So I think we have here uh, people who exemplify that yes, you can be a woman who's successful in the tech industry and you don't have to have a computer science degree to, to do that. Um, let's start by talking about the current landscape here. So recently there have been a lot of somewhat sensationalist articles published in Newsweek, the LA Times, for example, talking about the landscape right now for women in tech, talking about discrimination, sexual harassment. We have a high-profile lawsuit that's going on, uh, and women leaving tech in droves. Um, can you shed some light uh, onto, like, what, what does the data actually tell us about the situation here? And, um, Anne, in particular, you're on the board of Anita Borg, so maybe you have some. Yeah, so um, it's pretty bad. So I don't know how many of you have been following what's going on, both with uh, students, I mean, less and less students and women students, girl students, go into um, uh, technical studies or STEM, as we call it. Um, and um, so it's, uh, the numbers are not looking good. It's really going down, even for men, actually. So I think we have a problem with attracting uh, young students into uh, technical uh, studies and technical uh, education. Uh, and then if you look at the numbers for women in the job, I mean, I don't know if many of you have seen the recent articles, but uh, I mean, there was a very interesting article saying that women continue to leave the technical jobs in droves. Um, so it's not only in the US, uh, but in uh, developed countries, it's uh, even uh, bigger than everywhere else. And I mean, the data says that actually it's really critical because uh, computing jobs are really uh, being created every day. And um, some, uh, I think code.org say that actually by 2020, the number of computing jobs is going to more than double. And so if women continue to leave the jobs, I mean, there won't be enough uh, people to take their jobs. So we have to do something about it. The other thing that the data says, which is interesting, is that companies and teams that have more women are more successful. So it's somewhat ironic that we see women <laughs> leaping in droves and so forth. I, I personally think that we may be framing the conversation a little bit of the wrong way, which has to do with your introduction, which is, I think we need more women in technology. We certainly need more women in leadership. Uh, they don't all have to be engineers, though. And so while I think it is critical to get more women in STEM, I think for me the most important thing is that women feel like they have access and choice to do things that align with their natural talents and that those have pathways to leadership, including in technology companies. So for instance, when I look at our company, you know, our executive team is 40% women. Our general counsel is a woman. Our head of sales is a woman. She, I think, might be here somewhere. Um, whoop. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're incredible leaders in technology, and they followed the path that felt most exciting and most like a fit to them. And for some women, that will be computer science and engineering, and for some, it won't. And we need to encourage all those pathways. Um, you know, I started Eventbrite when I was 25, and I 
um, thankfully didn't know any better and so have sort of grown up in this in this industry and now 10 years later have created a company that um, I, I'm blessed to say is is almost 50-50 um, in, in gender balance but I think it's because there's a man and a woman running the company and it's honestly sometimes not so far off than what we see we can be. And I, I know that there are many nuanced issues that we will delve into, but I also think that on a day-to-day -day basis, it's really important to remember that we get um, our, our influence and our motivation from leaders that we can see and that we can emulate. And so in a, in a way, Eventbrite is a reflection of, of, the, of Kevin and I and the co-foundership that we have. Um, but I can also see that having more senior women in the company has really helped us bolster the confidence of, of not only the women in the company who are coming up through their careers, but our ability to recruit more senior women. So it's something that sort of builds on itself over time. Um, so one of the um, nuanced aspects of this topic is that I think most people don't necessarily think that they are sexist or that they're discriminating against women or people that are other. Um, but that we all hold hidden biases. I mean, we all do. It's human nature, and it's part of also what makes us successful. Um, would you feel comfortable talking about your own experiences? So, for example, have you ever um, been um, the recipient of hidden biases? Um, and if you don't feel comfortable talking about yourselves, maybe you can uh, share some insights into what are some common hidden biases that uh, women face. Sure, I mean, I think it, so oftentimes, and Eventbrite is also specifically, you know, in, in sort of, we have a lot of millennials at the company, so it's interesting, 18 to 34. Um, so I probably have a conversation at least once a month with somebody who's thinking about uh, starting a family, and that's the same conversation over and over and over again about how you can continue to have your career and start a family, which seems so crazy to me that I'm having this conversation in 2015. But um, I think as it relates to biases, I think the, the lack of confidence that we can do both as women is still very much present in young people. And we think that we're raising these empowered females and we're all kind of dealing with the same thing. I'll never forget when I found out I was pregnant with our first child, it was about three years after we started, or two years after we started Eventbrite, and I called my mom and said, now what? And it wasn't like I grew up in the, like, you know, more, I won't say the South, but more conservative. I grew up in Santa Cruz. So it's not, you know, I, I, was, I was very, uh, I was raised in a very empowering environment. But I had no idea how I was going to be running a company or growing a startup and growing a human being. And so one of the biases or the blockers that I find is very much present is that notion that you can, you doing many different things in your life at once. And what I like to say is that you, you got here somehow, you know, so you life hacked your way here to this job and in this place and in this time, you're gonna continue to figure it out. Um, but I think in terms of biases, maybe that's one that I see quite often that we hold against ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had tons of biases. I mean, being an engineer, I mean, how many times did I hear, oh, you're not technical enough to hear these discussions? or oh, and you're too nice, or, I mean, when you get angry, people tell you, oh, you're too aggressive, or, I mean, those are the kinds of things that I heard so many times, so it's just, yeah, it's very hard, I mean, and I notice myself, sometimes I biases myself too, uh, I mean, with other women, so I try to force myself because I understand uh, how I was treated by others, I understand, but sometimes it's hard to not stop yourself because you are shaped by the environment where you've been developed, right? So if everybody around you has some biases, you, you tend to develop them as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, when I did my first, so I, I'm from France, I guess you guessed from the accent. But <laughs> so when I, my first interview, actually, I was asked, how many kids do you want to have? And I was super surprised because it was, uh, I mean, for me, it was the person was already assuming that I was the one who would take some time off, which was not obvious to me at the time. And I was very surprised. I mean, now it's probably something they don't do anymore, but it was 20 years ago and they did it. So it's, it's so I mean, there are some of this bias. Uh, and what I find super interesting that some companies are starting to realize that doing some bias awareness training is really critical. 
And we have to really be um, very serious about really making those bias uh, very visible so that people realize that they have them because sometimes you don't even realize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my favorite story actually has to do with another speaking engagement I had and I was going up on the stage, I was plugging in my computer, getting ready to speak and the um, technical person came up to me and said, will he be using audio or media? And I was like, did you look at the program? I am not an assistant of someone, I'm the speaker. Um, and it's just one of those hidden biases that, you know, I, I don't even perhaps blame the person because there are many people who have female assistants and it, it's, it's a possibility that that could be true. But they're in there, they're sort of inside all of us. And I think that in some ways we actually are making it worse ourselves. So from my perspective, all these conversations that we have about things like the confidence gap and women don't speak up enough in meetings and women aren't, we actually are making our own biases worse by having this much conversation about sort of the, the differences between men and women. And we see it, we started a, um, a women's mentorship program at our company, it's called Woe, Women Helping Others Achieve. And it didn't come top down, it came you know, bottoms up from the women at the company who decided they wanted this program. And when we sent out the survey, we, the idea was we would pair them together as mentors and mentees. And we asked them how many wanted to be a mentor and how many wanted to be a mentee. And of all the women, almost every woman in the company filled it out, 99% said they wanted to be a mentee, 6% said they wanted to be a mentor. And so we took a step back and thought, God, what does this say that women don't feel at any stage that they're ready to mentor someone else? And we actually changed the entire program and we made them co-mentorship pairs. So we basically said, everybody's a mentor. Whether you like it or not, you all have something to teach and we all have something to learn. And I think if we can start framing the conversation differently, we actually have the potential to, to change it. And actually our words and actions really do have impact. One of my favorite studies, and I don't remember who ran it, but um, it's about test taking. And actually the, the words that the proctor uses at the beginning of the test have a hugely dramatic effect on the success of the people taking those tests. They've tested men versus women, they've tested people of color versus white people, and depending on what you say at the beginning will affect how they do. So I think we, it's just helpful for all of us to remember that the, w the way we talk and our actions do affect all those things. I think the study was, I think I read that study yeah, too, and I think it was like, if people were asked, are you male or female, like that, that like would predispose right. people to think like, oh, I'm good at this or I'm not bad at this, and that would affect their performance. Um, so there was a report from Catalyst recently that um, reported that women are leaving the workforce in tech, not because the work is hard, but because they're unhappy with their work environment. and. Um, you three are all in very senior, if not the top, uh, positions within your respective companies. Um, what are some constructive ways that um, companies and leaders within companies can um, address this issue and make it a positive work environment for women? I, th I think the first thing that you can do is actually change the ratio, right? So part of the problem is, as we can see when all these tech companies put out their stats, the ratios are just really bad. And especially in certain parts of the company, uh, there just aren't enough women for other women to feel comfortable, and it's especially true in tech. So, you know, when I first joined Change.org, it was like 99% men in tech. Granted, it was a small, it was a pretty small team. So, um, and we've doubled the size of the team, and we've quadrupled the number of women to try to get that ratio. So now we have 27% women on our tech team, and like you, 51% women at the company, and it really does feel meaningly dif meaningfully different. Um, because you, you do get a little bit of this sort of bro grammar culture going on. I think it's legitimate. Like I've actually had women come to me and say, I don't feel comfortable in the team at this other company. And we now are having women join our team specifically because they know there are enough women there. Um, the thing that has helped us the most, because I do hear a lot that, that it's a barrier, they can't find enough technical women and so forth. I think that's just not true. <laughs> I think they're really not looking hard enough. And 
Um, what we've found, <laughs> what we've found is that you have to a you have to look, and b you have to keep an open mind to where you look. So for us, one of the things that's been most helpful is using things like Hackbrite or Hack Reactor, and finding these boot camps that are training um, women later in their lives and as career changers. So you know, 20% of our total engineering team are career changers, and 70% of those are women. And they actually add a lot of value to the team because they bring other experience and ideas. Some of them used to be accountants or professors or things like that, and it actually brings a lot of perspective to the team. Um, but I think really addressing that ratio is sort of step number one. I yeah. also, oh, sorry, go ahead. I also think that uh, you know, you, there's so much power in having an open, transparent dialogue and forcing the issue, and I think it's. One of those topics that you know, you all, we all kind of talk around the fringes, but how often are you actually talking about it in your company? And that's the question I would have for many of the companies who say they want to change the ratio or they want to be um, a more gender balanced company or they want to change the, the sentiment or the, or the culture in their company is it really does start with open, honest dialogue. And obviously action has to follow, but if you're not even having the dialogue or you're afraid to have it, then nothing is going to happen. And one of the things that I love to do at Eventbrite is to really, you know, I don't have a background in HR. I do care deeply about the people and the way that we're building the company. So I'm constantly testing the boundaries of what we should be addressing as a company and really what we should be talking about. And I get to kind of play the founder card in, in pressing the issue. And I think that sometimes that's really a great way to break through and talking about what the actual issue is versus talking around it. But I agree, we've had tremendous success with Hackbrite specifically in bringing women into our, into our development team. And I do think that it's, um, that it's entirely possible to create a balanced tech team. I don't, I don't think that's impossible. But you also have to look at the founding DNA of each team. If you look at each company, there's a story there that started with the founding team. And overall, uh, in the Valley, you know, you do often see those, those sort of the, the young males starting companies. And so, of course, the first sort of group and cohort of that company is going to look a lot like them. That's what we do as humans. And breaking that down and understanding how to get more, found, how to get more female founders into the mix from the get-go, I think is really important as well. I think that's a catalyst for change. Yeah, I just wanted to say something about the data. So most of the time, companies don't are not serious about collecting the data about where they are about women. So I've seen many companies, and mine is an example, uh, where we don't really, we overlook the data. So we might, um, we might have great data overall, because yeah, there are many women in marketing and communications, in HR, etc. And then when you look at engineering, you have these groups with no women at all. And sometimes we don't really make the, the research that is necessary to really understand what we have and what we don't have. So start with the data. I was mentioning what Google is doing, I think, with uh, um, uh, gender bias awareness training. I think it's a great program because I don't really, I'm not really supportive of these trainings that try to make women into men. I mean, we have a lot of examples where they teach you, well, you have to be stronger, whatever. I mean, yeah, but we are women. And I think the value we bring by being not like men is fantastic, and we should keep that. And this is our authenticity as well. So I think um, I just wanted to say a few words about also critical mass. I think you touched a little bit. I think what is hard is when you are the only one. I think I've seen so many women come join team being the only one forever and living because it's super hard. If you are surrounded by men all the time, it's, it's a lot of pressure. So I think I would recommend that if you have one, try to have two so that they can really work together and I mean, struggle together. I mean, to be honest, sometimes it's struggling. So recently, as recently as this week, <laughs> there have been some very vocal feminists who have reacted very strongly against outspoken men who have come out in, um, like advocating for having more women in tech. Uh, so for example, Vivek Wadwa, um, and then what happened earlier uh, last year at the Grace Hopper Conference with Alan Eustace and Blake Irving and some other executives um, at um, pretty important companies. And um, these feminists claim 
that these men take the podium away from women and that they push an agenda that kind of reinforces what men want um, and or that they're, you know, they're self-serving agendas um, and that they're not well equipped to talk about kind of women's issues or women's needs. Um, and, um, and that the message focuses too much on blaming women, you know, it's too much victim blaming. Um, but I'm also concerned that this backlash um, has a potential negative effect of pushing men away from the conversation. And I think it's really important that we engage men in the conversation. I mean, it's at the point now where I think men are almost afraid to come out and speak out in favor of women in tech because they don't want, you know, they're, they know they're not perfect and they might get skewered for this. So, uh, you know, what's, what's the right way to have this conversation? Like, what is the place for confrontation versus compassion in this whole dialogue? And how can we do this in a way that is inclusive of all people uh, so that we can move forward together? Well, I think you have to remember what we're trying to solve for. So I, you know, any issue that is this uh, long living and multifaceted is going to have uh, personal agendas attached to it and many different points of view. And, you know, at the end of the day, I care deeply about building a company that looks like the world. And we're in pursuit of many different things in accordance to that, but it's not, um, I think that it's, it's tough to get caught up too much in the rhetoric um, and everybody kind of has their own agenda and, and why they talk about it or why they don't talk about it. I talk about it because I now understand how important it is to see other women like me and how much it means to me to know that there are other women like me trying to hack together raising two young children and running a company or, or growing a company. So that's why I do it. But, you know, I think we all need to at some point remember what the point of the conversation is and try to stay focused on that versus there's so, you know, there are many different uh, ways in which you can refute someone's um, message, even if it's coming from the right place in their own heart. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's pretty sad. I was at the Grace Hopper conference when Satya Nadella talked uh, made a mistake on stage uh, and asked women to uh, believe or trust karma for salary raises, which, yeah, it's wrong. But, uh, I mean, the guy was so kind on stage. I felt so bad that he was attacked so publicly on channels. I mean, the thing is that we won't change anything if we don't have men working with us. Uh, and for me, the diversity issue, gender or minority, is really a problem of inclusion. So if we uh, want to be included, we have to be inclusive as well. We cannot exclude ourselves uh, and be on the side and just expect that everything is going to change by fighting back against men. I think, I mean, they are, they are essential uh, in working with us to, to solve the issue and to really disrupt what's happening now for us. Yeah, I mean, I, this is a tragedy to me. I think that we should be encouraging everyone who wants to speak up for the rights of all other people. It's sort of, you know, would we say that straight people shouldn't talk about gay rights and white people shouldn't talk about rights for people of color? It just doesn't make any sense to me that we would be criticizing men who speak up on behalf of women. And they may not use the right words all the time and so forth, but the fact that they're doing it is a good thing. And to be honest, we'll we'll know we've succeeded when we don't have to talk about it anymore, when we don't have to have panels about women. And, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but to me, it sort of goes one step beyond uh, the speaking about it, and it actually goes to the modeling of it and the way that people behave. And one example, actually, um, last year, we launched a new parental leave policy where we decided that not only was it important for us to give generous paid parental leave, which honestly, the US is one of three countries in the world that doesn't do that. Um, so we offered 18 weeks of fully paid parental leave, but we offered it to all parents and specifically equal leave for mothers and fathers. Um, because I think having unequal parental leave is one of those examples of a policy in the workplace that actually perpetuates stereotypes against women. And the reason is because people have a reasonable belief that women will take more leave when they have children, because they do, because companies' policies suggest that they do. 
And so we said, well, the only way to change that is to give equal leave to men. And now what we need is for men to take it and to say, you know, I care about being there with my child too, and I'm willing to have a pause for my career for the few months that it might be, and so forth. So I think we need not only men speaking up, but men taking action to make this change. Yeah. Um, in our remaining time, do you have any um, final thoughts, anything that you want to add that we haven't talked about already, or any advice, or um, you'd like to leave the audience with? On this topic, I, I just want to make. I, mean, I wanted to make a connection with this conference, maybe with the wisdom part, and uh, I've been reflecting on. Um, I mean, why we should talk about that here, and I think what, and I don't have the answer, but uh, what I wanted to say is that I think by um, struggling sometimes, and I, I've been struggling with, um, yeah, being in an environment which is, yeah, hostile sometimes. It's hard to not feel isolated. And I think it's really, um, sometimes I also feel thankful that I've been there because you build some sort of wisdom by struggling that you don't build if you don't struggle. I mean, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying here, but it's really, um, I think it's by uh, having these difficulties, you really, uh, you have a chance and opportunity to grow bigger and uh, and taller and stronger, uh, which um, yeah I think I mean some somehow I feel like yeah I'm wiser. I was a woman technologist and uh, by the time I spent being there, uh, I've grew, I'm I've grown wiser and uh, so that's what I wanted to share. I guess in the spirit of what we said, maybe next year this panel won't exist, so we'll be in <laughs> shape, better shape. Oh, oh there will be men here, right? There will be men here. <laughs> yeah. And we'd be cheering them instead of booing them. Um, yeah, I think, I guess two things I would say. One is, um, as we talked about, we all have biases, so we need to be slightly easier on ourselves and easier on each other about them. I mean, our brains are wired to do that. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. We do it generally for survival and so forth. And, and I think if we could take more of an assume the best position and sort of help educate each other through those biases, we might end up in a better place. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, I, I think there is reason for optimism. Uh, I think the fact that companies come out and publicize their stats and are willing to talk about it, that things are headed in the right direction. And I you know, have the joy of seeing it happen every day on our website also, where young girls and women are starting these incredible campaigns and they're not listening to anyone who tells them they can't. Like, we had this incredible story a few weeks ago of these two eighth grade girls who read and heard about rape culture and what's happening on college campuses and they said, you know, they didn't just say, oh, that's bad. They said, I'm going to do something about it. And they started this campaign to get the concept of consent into the school curriculum in the entire um, area of Ontario, Canada. And they won. In like a matter of weeks, they've actually made a change. So I'm very optimistic about the next generation, and we should be encouraging them. Right. Julia, Anne, Jen, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your wisdom. Thank you. Yeah.